guys, we finally have particle nodes in the Blender master branch, which means that you can just go to the builder.blender.org website and download the latest 2.91 alpha build from here and you can start playing with the particles. How awesome is that? Um, right now, as of recording this video, the build boat seems to be broken. The last build is from a couple days ago. It should update every day. And so this build actually doesn't have some of the recently added particle stuff. So I actually had to build Blender from the source code, which took some time for me to figure out how to do. But it was interesting getting to know the process. And so, yeah, we have particle nodes. The visual node system itself has been there for some time now, but you couldn't actually do anything with the nodes until recently when uh, Jack started to add some of the basic functionalities to the particle system. So as you can see, now we can actually make some stuff with it. It's still pretty basic, there's not a whole lot of functionality just yet, but it's really interesting to see how it's slowly taking shape and getting new functionalities and stuff. Here's another test I made. So you can actually do some nice looking stuff already, even though it's very basic. This is just an emitter plane following this handwritten curve and it's emitting the particles. But let's make a new file and make a new particle node simulation from scratch so you can see the basic steps you need to follow to get to play with these new particle nodes. It's still early days though and some of these things will change and so depending on when you are watching this video some of the steps might not be the same anymore but I will definitely make more particle node videos so you will stay updated. So we have the new file open. Let's delete everything. The first thing you need to do is you need to go to the preferences from here and you need to go to the experimental tab here and enable the new particle system. It's not enabled by default because it's still a work in progress so you'll just need to enable it from here. And to get some particles we need to add a point cloud object. So shift A and here you can see a new point cloud object type. And it's a completely new thing in Blender. By default it only shows this random set of particles. They don't do anything if I play back the animation. We actually need to add a modifier to this point cloud object. So we can go here to the modifier panel and add a simulation modifier from here. So this whole simulation thing here is also a new thing in Blender. And it also has its own editor. So if we drag from the corner here and go up here and change the editor type, we can see this simulation editor here. You click this and you can see that it looks like a node editor. And that's what it is. The next thing is to go up here and click this plus icon to make a new simulation. So now that we have the simulation data block here, we can go to the modifier and assign the simulation to the point cloud object from this dropdown like this. So now this empty node tree is connected to this point cloud object. It still doesn't do anything. We need to add some nodes. So you can press shift A to add nodes. There's a big list of different kinds of nodes here. I won't go through all of these. I'll just show you the basic ones. So the first thing you need is the output node. And there's only one choice, the particle simulation node. So let's put that there. So this node is what you will connect everything to, to get the particles going. And this is important because for this modifier to work, it needs this data path. And that data path needs to be this name here. So you can just hover your mouse over this name and press Ctrl C to copy it. And then go back here and press Ctrl V to paste the name here. So now we have a complete setup and when we start adding stuff to the node tree, we should see particles moving. Okay, so if we take a closer look at this particle simulation node, you can see that there's three types of things going into this. There's emitters, events, and forces. And emitters are what they sound like. They emit particles. So shift A and emitters 
you can see that we have this particle mesh emitter node. And as of making this video, this is currently the only choice for an emitter. You can see that this other node is marked as a mockup. And throughout this node list, you can see that some of the nodes are not functional yet. They are marked with this mockup tag here, which is very useful because you can easily see which nodes will work and which won't. So we'll add a particle mesh emitter here. And this obviously needs a mesh object to work. So we'll just add a regular plane here. And now if we connect this emitter output to the input here, we should see some action when we play back the animation. Yeah, we got some particles. Right now when making the video, the default setting is that the particles will all die after two seconds. In my build, they just keep going for longer because I changed a value from the source code. Jack had it hard coded at two seconds and I just changed the value there so that I can have more time to play with the particles. But I'm sure that that hard coded particle killing event will be removed soon. So that's the emitter node. Let's also add one event and one force so you can kind of see what they are about. For the event, we can, for example, change the size of the particles, maybe make them a bit bigger. So in the node menu here, we need a couple things for that. We obviously need an event and we will make it a particle birth event. That way the particles will change their size when they are born and they will keep that size until they are told otherwise. So if we connect this here, the particle birth event node will execute an event when the particle is born and it needs something to be executed. So for that we will use an execute node and to change the size of the particle we can use this set particle attribute node. So let's just add this here. So this is a very central concept in particle nodes. Every particle has a set of default attributes and it's also possible to assign custom attributes. And they can be a few different data types, float, integer, boolean, vector, color, object, image. As of now, there will probably be some new data types in the future. The particle size attribute is called radius at the moment and it uses the float data type. A float is basically just a precise decimal number. So we can set this to something like 0.1 and then we can execute this when the particle is born. And at the moment to refresh the simulation, you have to go exactly to frame number one because there's no caching yet, but now the particles should be bigger. And yeah, they are. And you can change this attribute here and it will reflect in the particles. Okay, so for the forces, there's currently only one node we can use. It's here, force node. And what this node will do is it will apply a constant force of this velocity, which is defined as a vector, uh, to each particle individually. So if I have a force of minus one on the z-axis and we refresh the simulation, you can see that the particles fall down because they are being pulled down by this force of minus one along the z-axis. Okay, so that covers all of the three input types for the particle simulations. There's just one more interesting thing I want to point out, which is that when you do something for a particle, for example, apply a force to it, you can have it use different values for every individual particle based on their attributes. So in the add node menu, we have this input section here and we can input a particle attribute. So let's put this here. Let's make some room here. And let's, for example, take the position of the particle. So this is one of the default attributes you can use. And it has a data type of a vector. And let's also add another input node, this time the object transforms node. And if we now add an empty object to the scene, like this, and choose that empty object here for the object transforms node, we now have two vector inputs, one for the particle's position and one for this empty object's location. And with just a tiny bit of vector math, we can figure out the vector that goes from each individual particle to the empty object's location. So we need a vector math node, and we can find that from the converter section here, down at the bottom here, vector math. 
and now if we change this mode to subtract and we take the location of the empty object and from that we subtract the location of the particle that way we get the vector going from this particle to this object here and so now we can use this vector as the input for the force node here so let's move these here and connect this here so now this force node has a different vector value for every different particle because we used this particle attribute node here and what that will do is it will make every particle attracted to this empty object here so let's see what that looks like we can move this empty around and these particles will follow and try to get to the empty object and so now you can start to get an idea of the flexibility of the system you can do all sorts of things when you start to have individual control over every particle so that's a little preview of what's coming to blender like i said it's still in development things will change and there's not a ton of functionality just yet but if you are impatient like me and you want to start using it right now this should get you started and you can just start testing out all the different nodes that there is and see what they do and trying to achieve different effects just remember that the nodes that have the mock-up tag don't work they don't do anything so you should be good to go I hope you found this video useful. Thanks for watching. I recently went to pick cloudberries a couple times with my brothers. It's been the cloudberry season in Finland for the past couple weeks. And I have to say, the Finnish wetlands are incredibly beautiful. And what's the most striking thing there to me is the natural silence. It's not in every swamp, of course, but if you go to the ones in the wilderness like we did, you really notice the fact that you can't hear any traffic noise or anything man-made, basically. And it always gets me thinking about the slow and peaceful passage of time in nature, compared to the very hectic feeling passage of time in the urban world. When I'm out there in the swamps, I notice that it's a bit easier to let go of the past and the future and to just be there. If it weren't for the gnats and mosquitoes, it would be an amazing place for meditation. And that calmness and appreciation of the natural environment is something I always try to keep in mind when I go berry picking. If you are not from Finland, you probably don't know this, but in the traditional Finnish berry picking culture, there's a lot of very materialistically utilitarian attitude towards the berries. When you say to someone, I went to pick cloudberries yesterday, there's a good chance that their first reaction is, oh, how much did you get? You know, people do enjoy being out there, but a good deal of the attention still goes towards how much you get, how fast you can get it, and even how much you can sell it for. It's very nice that there is a market for selling and buying fresh hand-picked berries so that people can earn some extra and people who can't go berry picking can still get to enjoy them. It's just that I've seen that often that attention to the materialistic end result brings about a lot of unhealthy mental constructs. For example, in some places or families there's traditions of hiding the best picking places from outsiders. And that leads to a negative attitude towards others when inevitably someone else finds the same place. Or if you are concentrating mostly on just making money, there can be a lot of unnecessary disappointment if the harvest is not very good or something else goes wrong. So because of those kind of things, I always want to keep in mind that I get to be happy and grateful for each and every berry that finds its way into my bucket. And I also get to enjoy the nature and the presence and the physical activity even if there's zero berries. And I get to invite people to the best places and share the amazing experience and share the harvest also. I've heard that over 90% of the berries are left in the nature anyways, so it's not like there's a shortage. Anyways, that's just an interesting tidbit of the Finnish berry picking culture for you. There's of course a lot of positivity also, and it's been very nice to see so many people out there picking this year. It's even more than usually, which is great. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.